there out there, um, you know, for us to give that topic to our young people and um, influence them to have dinner table conversations. Um, I'm not sure of how much uh, you heard me say because, you know, technology, we're dealing with technology these days. So <laughs> things can be a little rocky with technology, but we are going to press forward in the topic tonight because we only have actually um, one hour to discuss this topic. I'm a little behind because once again, excuse me, technology does seem to um, sometimes take over, you know, what you're trying to do. Um, so I'm, I'm just still, you know, happy to be here uh, and have the conversation with you all here tonight. Um, <clears throat> originally, this was not the, the, you know, presentation that I wanted to do, but um, kind of ran into some things. So I had to go to what I knew to make this happen tonight, because I want to make sure that we're learning to have dinner table conversations on some of those hard topics, okay? Um, because one of the things that I've noticed is that when we don't talk about it, you know, it hurts our children more. They're gullible. When they get out there in the world, they become gullible to things. But if we talk about it at the dinner table, it puts our young people in a prevention mind state. When we share our stories, when we talk about, you know, some of the things that we have done to self-harm as parents, as um, brothers and sisters, as um, clergymen uh, and women, as uh, teachers. You know, you have some teachers, some mentors and things who share their story. We have our brothers and sisters who are in, a pen in the penitentiary and who have been able to share their stories through domestic violence with as many tags organization in front of a group of teen boys and girls, you know, and share their struggles. So when we talk about these things with our young people, it actually puts them more in a prevention mind state, which that's the route we want to go. Because when they're out in the world, they'll remember, their brains will be prompted to remember, oh, wow, I heard Queen of Fee talk about this topic. And, you know, I know some things about this topic. I don't think I necessarily want to indulge in something like that. You know, they have the, they can make that choice because we've been having the dinner table conversation. So that's why tonight um, self-harm is a very important one. It's one that people don't even realize that we actually do to ourselves. You know, we get inflicted by others, you know, causing pain to us, of course. But that kind of leads into us causing pain to ourselves a lot of times. And so we begin doing things to our bodies or to um, to our insides, to our inners, you know, that causes a lot of destruction to the body, to the brain, body, mind, body, spirit aspect um, of our life. Right. So what is self-abuse or what is self-harm? You know, what are those harms that we do do to the body? Um. And I was trying to pull this slide up, but I don't think it's going to let me do it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. This is so weird when you're trying to share, you know. When you're trying to share. <laughs> okay, so um, self-harm is going to be, or self-injury or um, self-abuse is going to be, it's going to be, when you're hurting yourself on purpose, you know, to relieve maybe emotional pain that you may have felt, you know, as that young girl, as that young boy who may have been, you know, in a situation or grew up at a dinner table where domestic violence was sort of taking place at your dinner table. And so uh, you begin to harm yourself because you need a safe space to escape you know, the verbal, the emotional, um, the sexual, the physical abuse. You need a place to escape within, you know, that harm that could have been caused to you directly or could have been happening at your dinner table 
indirectly, but it's still causing harm to you directly. Okay. Um, so hurting yourself or thinking about hurting yourself is, of course, a sign of the emotional distress. These uncomfortable emotions may grow more intense if a person continues to use self-harm as a coping me mechanism. So here's what you're saying, you know, because this happened to me, I look in that mirror. There's a lot of young boys, a lot of teen boys and girls who look in that mirror and do not like themselves because they're going through, you know, traumatic experiences of what could be happening in the household. You know, so we got to set the bar where, you know, our young people know that, again, there is a safe space for our young people to um, be able to talk about things that they may be going through. You know, it's sort of the, the same with people say each one teach one. That really is a thing. Like we really should be teaching our young people about the hard topic conversations and really getting them in tune with you know, having the conversations that we struggle with having. Um, and granted, it's going to be a struggle for all of us. You know, it's, it's a struggle for all of us to talk about the things that we've experienced, to talk about that trauma, to talk about, you know, really sharing what that trauma could look like. But do we need to share that trauma? We do. You know, um, do we need to keep our stories to ourselves. We don't because a lot of times that spills right over into self-harm, you know, because we don't have those people who we feel like should believe in us, you know, who should, you, who should, you know, instill values in us or, you know, create that safe space for us where we can talk about, you know, the things that we experience right at our dinner table. I mean, who can you share with? It's one of those things when my young people say, if I couldn't share with my mother and father, then who was I supposed to share with, Miss Queen? I mean, don't you think that's a valid point? When we have young people that are struggling, first of all, with communication, you know, and then we put them in harm's way at, at some of our dinner tables, our young people are at harm's way, you know. Um, so, yeah, how do we get them in tune with a conversation like self-harm? you know, right at the dinner table where you as parents or you as that caretaker or even you as adoptive parents, you know, can begin to share your struggles and help those children that are right at our dinner table identify with something like self-harm. I'm trying to tell you one thing that I know about my young people is that they want to have these conversations like they are so nosy, you know, <laughs> And if you are being genuine, if you are being, you know, that person who is encouraging them, that person who is showing them empathy, even though they make mistakes, they don't get it right. You know, they do things as young people. You know, they say things as young people. Um, we've all had risky behavior. We've all acted erratic. We've all been cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, as I say to myself, you know, um, we've all experienced something that we can share with our own children at that dinner table. We just got to come out of the shame and the guilt, you know, and, the, and some of us in the pity parties and, you know, still in the blaming stages of our traumatic experiences. And, you know, we haven't gotten the therapy that we need to be able to really discuss our traumatic experiences with our young people at the dinner table. And so that young person is going to go and find an outlet to let out the emotional pain that they may be enduring right at our dinner tables. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that, you know, this young girl, this young boy would go out into the streets or, you know, go to an older man or older woman or um, go to drug addiction, alcohol addiction um, to be able to let go of their feelings. Like, it's alarming to think that. But we have a lot of young people who do go that route because they don't feel safe right at their own dinner tables. They feel like their dinner tables, you know, uh, traumatize them more. They feel like their dinner tables just don't understand. They feel like their dinner tables just don't hear them. They feel like their dinner tables are not compassionate. 
they feel like their dinner tables have forgotten where they came from, you know, and that's valid to say. That's valid to say. That's valid to see. You know, where we have a lot of young people who feel like, <laughs> you know, how am I going to talk to her or him? You know, every time I try to say something, it's little children ought to be seen and not heard. Every time I want to voice my opinion or, you know, speak my piece or share my story, it's little children ought to be seen and not heard. I mean, that's valid. Okay, so when you tell a child that, they take it personally. They take it personally. They really do. You may say, oh, they shouldn't take it as personally as they do, as they do, but they do take it personally. They don't understand, you know, you know, this person saying who's supposed to love me, who's supposed to care about me, you know, saying that I can't, you know, listen to you. I can't, you know, share with you. I can't be open with you, you know, because that's what the dinner table conversation is about. It's about talking about self-harm. It's about talking about self-abuse. You know, it's about talking about domestic violence. It's about talking about these things. And when we have our teens who, you know, boys and girls, uh, young women and young men who say, you know, Queen, I was cutting myself as a way to relieve that pain. Uh, it hurts. It breaks my heart to hear my young people tell me that. But you know something, though? I have a story that goes right along with what they're talking about. I have a story that follows up with that. I can relate to them. They can relate to me. They open up more. This is what we have to start doing with our young people at our dinner table. It's very hard. It's a struggle for me to do it at my dinner table. But we got to do it because at the end of the day, it makes our young people so much more smarter so much more resilient, so much more open to share their pain and say, you know, this is happening to me. I feel these feelings when you bring this person around. They make me feel uncomfortable. You know, when that person jumps right to, I can bring whoever I want around my house. This is my house. I can do what I want to do. I can bring who I want to bring. You ain't, you don't pay the bills in here. You know, parents jump into that. And it's not even about that. It can be legitimately legitimately son or daughter tell me why this person makes you feel uncomfortable certainly because in your lifetime you felt uncomfortable in environments like you know what that means when a young person says i feel uncomfortable but why do we act like we don't know okay why do people self-harm so why do our young people self-harm self-harm is not Sometimes, you know, necessarily associated with a mental illness, but a behavior that indicates a need for better coping skills. So if, you know, if if children, if our young people are seeing you at the dinner table where, you know, you're still in traumatic situations, you're still in traumatic relationships, you know, you still have, you know, the hoorah, hoorah going on in your life. Um, it makes our young people scared, you know, um. And nobody is not talking to them. Nobody is not relating to our young people and, you know, what they're feeling. And so, you know, to say to a young person, oh, you're not really hurt. You're just seeking attention. Really? Really? Okay, so me as Queen of Fee, mental health professional, mental health consultant, and I'm a nobody. Really? But I'm listening to what you're saying to the child. Um, and, you know, it puts the child more in a self-harm state. You know, it makes the child. Now, not only did your friend make the child uncomfortable, but you're making your own child uncomfortable right at your dinner table where that is supposed to be the safest space for this child to tell you why I'm self-harming myself. OK, so, you know, we as a. Uh, as dinner table leadership at the dinner table, we got to be more transparent. We have to be more open to the truth of our young people and really listening to what it is that they say could make them uncomfortable. Now I get it. Some children are more dramatic than others. We know this. I have a couple of my own that I've born into the world. Okay. They're more dramatic. Um, they require more attention. They require more em empathy. 
they require more encouragement. It doesn't mean that they're seeking attention. You know, um, is could that be that you don't give your children attention? And so you jump into you're seeking attention because you know that your time is occupied with maybe domestic violence. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe inappropriate relationships. Maybe you have an addiction yourself that takes up all of your time. And so you don't give your children attention. And so you link the child's self-harm being to, oh, they're just seeking attention. Because you know you're not giving them no attention. That's why. That's why a parent would say that. Because you know you're not giving the child no attention. So that's why you're going to go into the child is seeking attention. Miss me with that. Um, And y'all know this is dinner table conversation at its best, boo-boo. Where my young people at? I hope y'all chimed in. I hope my young people listening in because let's what? Let's do this. Let's keep it real. Let's keep it real. I hear parents say all the time, oh, he was she was seeking attention. And this child is saying, I'm really not seeking attention. Miss Queen, this person really makes me feel uncomfortable when they come around. I feel like he or she look at me in certain kind of ways that I feel like is inappropriate to me. Really? Okay, well, tell me why do you feel like that? Tell me more of why you feel like that. You know, and then the child goes into why I feel like this. And then the child, and then I say, well, you know, what are you doing to cope with what you're feeling? Because, you know, mommy and daddy may not be tuned into what you're actually feeling. Well, you know, I keep liquor bottles under my bed or, you know, I drink. I take a few drinks. I go to their bar and still their liquor and I drink, you know, or I make sure I have razors on me because I cut my arms. I cut my legs. Queen, I cut in places where they can't see, you know, where I can still wear my long sleeve shirts and my shorts. So um, where are you cutting? I mean, where are you cutting? See, and the child may say, you know, after things, you know, have healed, they may say, oh, my cat scratched me or, you know, I got into a little play fight with this one and that and we got the scratching and all. And a whole time it could be the child really self-harming itself. You know, it could be really self-harm. But if we're not talking to our young people about self-harm, how are they going to know what they're doing now? How are they going to really know that? what they're actually doing to themselves if we don't have dinner table conversations like this with our young people. Nicole, sis, what you say? You say some of our kids have parents who are not as supportive as we are. True. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, parents who, you know, have those stories, sis, but don't actually know how to share the stories with their own children because they think if they share the stories with their children, it will lead them to lead, lead the children as the potential to lead the children down those dark paths. But I'm saying to our parents tonight, that's not the case. What it does is it puts the child in more of a prevention mindset. And so that when they are experiencing things, when they do get out there into the world, they're able to make a decision. You know what? I've had this dinner table conversation before and like this doesn't lead anywhere good. Like maybe I should talk to somebody like maybe I should try to talk with somebody. That's the route that we want to go, you know, that will help our young people get into the prevention mindset as opposed to, you know, parents thinking that they're telling their children something that could harm them. And I understand, you know, you want to protect your children. You want to, you know, give them the best and you you want to, you know, you know, look perfect in their eyesight. You know, you don't want to look like you have any flaws as a parent. You know, you're born this beautiful life into the world. But let me tell you something about my young people. Let me tell you something about my young people, okay? They want to know what mommy and daddy, what those caretakers, what my adoptive parents, they want to know what my same-sex parents they want to know what you've been through. And they literally have the right to know what you've been through. Because after all, who am I really sitting at the dinner table with? Who are these people? 
and they're watching things on TV. So they see things come across the media, you know, um, so they see violence there. So they know that violence is in the world. They're seeing things at school, you know, even in daycare, I saw things, you know, so we got to, you know, find the strength in our hearts to begin to share our, you know, our secrets, those scandals and secrets and stuff with our young people, because I'm telling you, I promise you, it's going to put them more in a prevention state. And this is where we want them to go. This is what we want their brains to start processing that they can actually say, wow. They can have that moment and say, wow, like I'm at a whole fret party. And like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I may have a drink or two, queen, but I'm not putting my cup down. You see, because I know that people are around here dropping, you know, date rate drugs, drugs in, you know, our cups or whatever. We've had instances with this happening on our, on our campus, you know, so we want to make sure that we're opening up and sharing with them. You know, some of our parents that were college students experience, you know, the date rape, the date rape drug right there on the campus. And your child goes to college and you do, you do not share these things with them. But these are the things I promise you that they want to know. Um, Since what you say, you say, um, I think. Had my mother had those conversations with me. I would have been better prepared. I agree. You would have been much better prepared. Um, and my mom is saying, I told you about me and your dad, and you did. And you did. And, you know, the one thing that helped me, you know, with my self-harming is that you did share those things with me, you know. Um, and I was able to ask questions. Like, <laughs> I was able to ask questions. That's the good thing, like. The child is able to sit there and ask those hard questions, like those deep, you know, spicy, nosy questions that is helping their brains identify with what mommy and daddy or with, with what our caretakers or with what our adoptive parents, our same-sex parents are sharing. It's amazing to have our young people open up and tell us and ask these questions that are just amazing. And the other thing about that is that they go through these levels, you know, the brain goes through certain cycles. And so those conversations get more in depth and the questions get more detailed. You know, the child really wants to feel like, like mommy is like, oh my God, like she tells me everything. Like my mom tells me everything. You see what I mean? That young boy, that young boy, that young girl really want to feel like my mom and dad tells me everything. Like they literally don't hide nothing from me. This is great. This is perfect. This is what I want. This is what I want <laughs> for your dinner tables. This is this will help me in my work. <laughs> I can kind of take a back seat because we're actually having these dinner table conversations that, you know, clergy can't help us have. You know, everything, every mentor can't stop what they're doing and come to your dinner table. And help. Every therapist, every psychologist cannot stop what they're doing, come to your dinner table and help you. Your spiritual mother and father cannot stop what they're doing and come and help you. You know, you have to be leadership at your own dinner table. You did that. You did that. And yes, it's okay to reach out for help and, you know, reach out to professionals, not your family. Reach out to professional people that you feel like are, you know, truthful, honest, and fair. Who can help you discern and get the conversation started at your own dinner table. This, this is going to be amazing. This is what we want. For our young people, we want to know why our young people, why do they self-harm? We want to know this. March is, of course, um, Self-Harm Awareness Month. And so, you know, I've been having this conversation since 2012 um, about this because it really is something that we need to talk about with our young people because they really do be self-harming. Quiet. I'm on here. They really do self-harm. So, we want to make sure that we're having those tough conversations with them, but that it's a space where they feel enlightened, they feel safe, they feel encouraged, they feel empathy, they feel guidance, they feel, you know, structured, they feel like it's okay, you know, it's okay that I've done this, you know, and here's how we're going to work through it, son or daughter, to 
get you up to a space where you're feeling good about yourself, you know, and if mommy, daddy need to accompany you on this, on your journey, we are here to do it with you. This is how we begin to help them with coping with things that they may feel that are uncomfortable for them, you know, challenging for them. School is challenging for every child. You know, um, even the smartest children are challenged. And even those smartest children find ways to cope because they want to release that emotional pain that they feel is a distress on them. You know, so we got to be talking about our conversations. Thank you all for chiming in tonight, you know, with me at the dinner table. I love, love, love having these conversations. And I want my young people to know that Queen of Feet got your back. You know, I'm, I'm going to put it out there for my young people to say, oh, my, she's talking about something here. You know, um, she barking up my truth. The question was, why people self-harm? Why do our young people self-harm? That was the question. The urge to hurt yourself may start with um, anger. It may start with overwhelming anger. It may start with frustration. It can start with the emotional pain. You know, when a person is not sure how to deal with emotions or learn as a child to hide the emotions, which is where we go back to little children ought to be seen and not heard. Right when you prompt them with that, they begin to hide their emotions because they feel unfelt. They feel unatoned. They feel emotionally neglected. They feel hurt behind that. And this is, um, you know, things that People have said at the dinner table for years and years and years and years, they have said this. And it has traumatized every single gen generation <laughs> who have come up with little children ought to be seen and not heard. It has traumatized every single boy and girl who have come up with this saying at their dinner table. It's inappropriate. It's unacceptable. And it really does not encourage our young people to open up and want to share with you. And so when their best friend's mother knows stuff about your own child that you should know, remember that you said little children ought to be seen and not heard. Remember, you said that. And this is why you're oblivious to what your child is going through. But your child, best friend, mother or father knows everything because the child feels felt there. The child feels atoned there. The child feels like their feelings are valid there. You know, sometimes injuring yourself stimulates the body's um, euphorians or pain killing hormones, um, thus rising their mood. Sometimes, you know, it, it, it releases, you know, dopamine to the brain for that young child. You know, they get that rush of, whoa, wait, you know, when you get your rush, when you drink or when you, you know, when you smoke or whatever it is that you do. You get that little rush. That's the same thing that self-harming could do for our young people as well, which can make it more addictive, which makes it more addictive when it gives you that rush to the brain like that. Um, and then and in that moment, you know, the question then becomes, well, how long has my child been doing this? You know, because now it's in a place where it's addictive, you know, and the brain is constantly seeking that rush. Um, so, you know, we got to be very, very, very careful about the things that we say, because verbal abuse is the number one way, the number one way, verbal and emotional abuse, the two of those slides go together, two of those tags go together. I say slides because I teach it. So, but the two of those tags go together. You cannot have one without the other. Verbal abuse and emotional abuse is vicious to any child, even in the womb. And research is starting to show that our young people are affected in the womb by the verbal and the emotional abuse, by that domestic violence setting, by untreated mental illness. Our children are affected in the womb by this. You know, research, call me out on it. Call my bluff. You think I'm lying or... I don't know what I'm talking about. Call me out on it. I'll take that. Self-harm 
isn't the same as attempting suicide. However, it is a symptom of emotional pain that should be taken very seriously. If someone is hurting themselves, they may be at an increased risk of feeling suicide, feeling suicidal. So initially, it may not start out as, you know, suicide. Like when we took that initial, initial puff of the blunt, you know, it was recreation. They say it's recreation, you know. They say it's good for the soul. They say that, uh, you know, marijuana manages the, the, um, your anger. I hear people say they smoke marijuana to, to manage their anger. That's what my young people tell me. And um, marijuana is really a depressant, you know. And if the child is already depressed, we don't want them smoking marijuana because then they're going to be more depressed and they're going to be suicidal. If they using PCP, if they using uh, crack cocaine or cocaine, if they using alcohol, if they using K2, you know, these things, a lot of them are depressants. And so we, we want to bring that young boy, that young girl out of depressed state. We don't want to seep them into depressed state where they become suicidal. So their self-harm now turns into suicidal. And so now, yes, I've been cutting myself just to get blood, just to release a little pain. But now I'm going to cut deeper because I want to die at this point. I mean, to sit here and think, to sit here and think of our young people cutting themselves to bleed profusely, to die when their life is just begin. Man, oh man. I get emotional behind it. I get very emotional behind it because every child deserves an opportunity to flourish, to grow, to be happy, to be them true selves. You know, um, I heard it said once that uh, a mother's child was murdered, you know, um, and she didn't get to love him because he was coming out of the closet. You know, um, he was coming out of Carson. And so he was in, you know, in some very dark, deep, dark spaces, you know, because it's like if mama don't love you, who don't love you, you know, and she regretted that. She regretted those feelings. You know, she said, I wish, I wish, I wish I could take it back. I wish I could take it back. I would do this all over again. I would not put my son in a position where he felt like I didn't love him. I didn't care about him. I didn't want his happiness. See, I mean, when a parent have to go into that state, and trust me, I know that state very well. I know that state very well. When we have to go into that state, it is truly not a good space because now the parent could potentially go into a self-harming phase. So, you know, it's, it's like a ripple effect when these things happen to us. We must talk at the dinner table. We must talk about it. And I think about, I think I was maybe, and my mom knows, maybe I was around, I guess, maybe 14 or whatever. I'm in love. I, you know, I love this person. They don't really care about me. You know, we think when we're young and in love, it's the end of the world, honey. It's only one and I'm going to be with this one. I'm never going to have another one. I believe I took a whole handful of pills. I tried to kill myself. This is something that I really share uh, because my testimony is so... <laughs> Jesus Christ, hallelujah, thank the Lord, praise him, okay? Because my testimony is so long, and I'm so young, but my testimony is so deep. And, you know, when you when you come into a healing space and the yellow brick road to healing is long, sisters and brothers, y'all hear me say that all the time. That yellow brick road to healing is long. I mean, we're going to be forever healing. And the good thing about, you know, you know, therapy and, you know, your prayer clauses with God or your faith base is that it, it starts to reveal things to you. 
you know, and you chime into that piece and say, dang, I did try to commit suicide. I did. I was, I was on the steps in my, in my childhood house, my fourth street house at the time. And uh, yeah, I believe I took a whole handful of pills. I think I wanted to die. I think I did want to die. I was, you know, trying to kill myself because I wanted him to be with me and like me and love me, you know, and um, real love doesn't work like that. Real love takes time. It's a process, you know, um, to you learning to love yourself and then you learning to love somebody else. It's a process. But when we're young, when our young people are young, when we're young, we don't think like that. We take risks with our life. It's just something that we do in the brain, you know, in the brain is just something that we do as young people, because when we start getting, you know, 25 and above, we want to be to have some things out of some childhood things and some risky behaviors out of the way when we get older, you know, um, and that's fair. I, I, I get that. I identify with that. Um, I think, you know, that's good. But I also think that, you know, in the midst of our young people being young adolescents, that we still got to have these conversations with them to help them get into a prevention mind state so that they don't, you know, that young girl know that, you know, she's going to come out of this and that love really is a process, you know? Um, and that is what my mom had to tell me. I don't know what she told me because I was out. I know I probably scared the dog mess out of my mother and father sitting up here and took a whole handful of pills. I don't even know if my mom even remembers this. Mom, do you remember this? She's on here somewhere. Um, I don't even know if she remembers, you know, this when I did this, but you know, God had to bring that thing to the front of my prefrontal cortex and help me see queen, you didn't been in some stuff now. So, um, that's a part of my testimony that I don't share, but, but this topic again, self-harm, I know how real it is for our young people. I know that it becomes the safe space for them to release pain you know, or get that rush of dopamine, which, you know, love can bring dopamine. If you love your child, if you speak in life into them, that shoots the dopamine in their brain. It really does. And so they could self-harm to do that, to get that rush of love, you know, so it, it, it's a very delicate subject. Um, and so we can't say that the child really self-harming themselves that they would never take it as far as committing suicide because they could. Oh, my mom said, yeah. And it almost killed me. Right. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, I know I probably almost, you know, I've made my mom and dad probably terrified. Like past the gas and was on that jump. Right. Like what the world, Jesus, get my daughter. Cause I don't know what's going on with her. Like, you need to <laughs> wrap your love arms around that girl. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, see, um, I ain't about the 50 plan out here. You know, my mom is here confirming that my story is true. You know, um, but this is why I love to share. This is why I love to share with you guys. Like, this is why I love all of you. I love all of you so much who chime into domestic violence with many tags organization over the last 14 years you've been chiming in with us as we've been you know remote we've been in person you know um doing and having these dinner table conversations and trying to just you know bring new perspectives and have everyone create a safe space right in the home right in the home we need to create our safe spaces right in the home um Treatment and coping with self-harm for our young people. Um, you know, there is effective treatments for self-harm that can allow a person to feel, you know, more in the center of their self, more, more affectionate towards themselves, um, more loving towards themselves. So there is that part of it where um, you know, we can kind of get a rally around that young person and really share those stories. I, I, I realized that, you know, because I've done sister circles in people's houses, in their basements, in their living rooms, in their backyards. And we've had our young girls there, including my daughter at the time, 
um, talking about these conversations. And I, and I realized that when we rally around them as older women, as, you know, sisters who have been through something, they really get it. Like it, it feels like they have a ton of bricks lifted off their shoulder to know that I'm not alone to have that young man know that I'm not alone. And it's unfortunate. It's a lot of our young men who self-harm who feel alone. And, you know, research is saying that our young men commit more suicides, you know, because they don't have the safe space. They really don't have other men who rally around them and talk about these kind of topics like self-harm with our young men. I will. I'll do it. I do it with my children. I do it with my sons all day. I will. We got to stop making differences in the conversation. We have to talk to our young boys and we have to get them included in the conversation. We have to encourage them to share their feelings because otherwise we create a beast. We create a monster. We create a young man who is prone to getting out there and potentially committing suicide. And I mean, if you don't want your daughter to commit suicide, you don't want your son committing suicide either. It hurts. It flat out hurts to have our children feeling alone and killing themselves right while we in the bedroom sleeping or we work too much. We work too much. We got too many devices going on or we got too many other little children so we can't get to our teenage children. You know, we got to, we got to do better. We got to prioritize better and I'm with it. I ain't saying nothing that uh, I ain't don't need myself because I don't come on here 50 playing with nobody. My mom said, yes, he did. My dad went to the church and had, and prayed for me and the church prayed for me. And look where you're at now. Well, bless your heart, mom. Thank you so much. For, you know, you and my dad for saying something, I guess. I mean, doing something that you felt was right, that you felt could help me. But I tell you, the main thing that helped me at my dinner table was being able to see my mom just, you know, say, you're beautiful. You know, for my mom to continue to tell me those things. You know, you will make it through this. My dad tell me, you will make it through this. You know, and we are right here to support you. They never said, you got to get through this. You got to get over this. You got to, got to, got to do this and you got to do that. They never said those things to me. See, that's why we need to know the words that we say out of our mouth. We need to know compassion. We need to speak with empathy. They said, you will get through this. We will support you getting through this. You're not by yourself. These are the things that we have got to tell our young people who are struggling and some of us, we see them struggling. We know they struggling with who they are, their identity. At that age, you're struggling with your identity. You're struggling with your body, you're struggling with your hair. You're struggling with your nose, your lips, your eyes. You're struggling just as a young teen and all the, you know, the hormones and things that are changing in our bodies and in our brains. We're struggling there. And then we got to go to school. And then we got households that are corrupt. That teaches us nothing about our identity and who we are. You know, teaches us nothing about our DNA and where we come from. And I'm not talking about Dr. King and Harry and Tubman DNA. I'm talking about your DNA, that egg and that sperm that born you in the world. We don't talk about that with our young people. Some of us could go and do the ancestry.com to bring our young people to the table and say, look, this is where you come from. This is your bloodline. This is what we have gone through as a family. These are the medical things that we struggle with. A lot of young people don't know, you know, if their grandparents had mental illnesses or not. They don't know why they stress to seep into these deep, deep, dark spaces because we don't tell our young people about their history of predisposition to mental illnesses, to those suicide, to schizophrenia, to PTSD. And of course, PTSD is going to really trail with trauma. We don't talk about that. You know, we just say, uh, it'll work itself out in due time. You just keep on praying to the Lord. 
Come on over and let me lay hands on your child and rebuke them demons out of him. Man, miss me with that. Miss me with that situation right there. When we talk about our young people, we got to do better at being more transparent. Your story, your PTSD that you got will save your child from a life of PTSD. PTSD don't require all these medication stuff. It requires us to talk and open up and share so we can save our children. After all, you wanted the baby you had him or her. Why not be honest and real and open and truthful with this baby? This is what we take on when we become responsible for young people, for children. Whether we adopt them or not, we become responsible for giving them their identity. Come on now, work with me. I know. I know. It's, it's crazy. I know. I know, Queen Fee. You need to go ahead on about your business. Like, them tape conversation get ready to be over five minutes. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I'm going to use every single bit of my five minutes <laughs> to advocate for my young people out there that I know are struggling with self-harm. So what objects can be used? It could be the razor. You know, it could be multiple razors. It could be, it could be, you know, alcohol. It could be, you know, how child drinks a lot. It could be marijuana, uh, K2, some of the, you know, PCP, some of the things that our young people are indulging in to help with their pain. Um, you know, so it could be that. Um, it could be, uh, you know, where they have, uh, they get, they have like sort of a strategy of, hanging themselves see what i mean we have some children who know how to wrap a belt around their neck attach it to something and knock themselves out and be able to bring themselves back hmm queen of fee we never thought about that one there i know um they think of so many things you know and then you have things like TikTok and you know uh, instagram and all these other places who Teaches our children how to commit suicide and do self-harm. Literally. Um, some of our children punch walls and punch, punch their fists, break their hands and break their bones intentionally to feel that pain, to release that pain or feel that pain. Come on now. Sis, what you say? The wire out of the bread tie. Come on now. They the wire from the mask. Come on now. They know what to do. Come on now. Come on now. My mom say, women, please let your real men raise your son, raise your boy. Let the real men raise your boys who can have these kind of conversations with your sons. You know, a brother who ain't afraid to share his traumatic story. A brother who's not afraid to chime into that young boy PTSD and say, look, I had the same thing you had. Brother, you ain't by yourself, young man. I'm right there with you. See, that's a fact right there. Think about all of the ways that our young people, you know, are your cords popping up missing from the house? You know, are your electric cords? Every time you turn around, you got to buy more electric cords. Could that be a way that our young person could be self-harming themselves. And one of them times that they put that cord around their neck or that rope around their neck, they're going to time out. They're going to time themselves right on out. They're going to do the countdown. And you won't get the news later on. And you're going to be saying, why? What? 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 Jesus Christ, help us. Help us, Lord. I'm going to have to say a prayer for the last minute. What to do when someone self harm? Perhaps you have noticed um, a friend or family member that frequently um, bruises or, with, you know, got bruises on them or bandages. You see a lot of Band-Aids or, you know, a lot of wraps. You got you got galls in your house for some reason. Like, and this child constantly saying, can you get some galls? Something could be going on there that is associated with self harm. Um, keep in mind that this behavior, uh, 
that might be part of a larger condition. You know, it could be something linked to something else going on with the child. Um, and it, so we got to keep that in mind. So that's where the question comes like, you know, what is, you know, how can I help you or tell me more of why you self harm? Sort of go that route with them as opposed to what the, f oh, excuse me. I was about to cuss. I'm sorry. You know, we got some parents who just jump right into that. That is not going to hurt. And granted, I know the parent, you're shocked. You, you can't believe it. You know, it's your child. You feel like you've been doing the best that you could do, that you know how to do, but you got to do more. You got to do more of having dinner table conversations that are hard topics. Okay. Uh, they may make statements that sound hopeless or worthless, you know, have poor impulse control or have difficulty getting along with others. So it can definitely look, definitely look like anger as well. Okay. Um, and uh, this has come from the National Alliance of Mental Illnesses, which I really like them because they um, sort of keep it real like me. <laughs> So you can go there and, you know, kind of pick up some more information for that young person uh, or you as a parent, you may may see some things, you know, this may have woke you up as a caretaker, as an adoptive mother and father, as mentors, as, you know, um, uh, clergy, you know, faith based. This may have opened you up more. You say, well, I want to tap in a little more and try to get more information, go to the uh, National Alliance for mental illnesses they have some really good things on their uh website to continue to help us get better at having these hard topic conversations um so i want us to really really do that um when we see things because a lot of us are grandparents you know um the grandparents are getting younger you know we want to do our thing like i want to go to the party like <laughs> i don't want to watch blake but guess what I got to pull over skirt, chime into Blake and make sure that she's okay too on this journey. So some of us have our grandchildren that we have in the household with us as well. You know, we've got to make sure that they're okay as well. We've got to make sure that we be transparent with them too. You know, um, we got to, uh, you know, be sure that we are open. Some of us are great grandparents who are happening to do this job to be parents all over again. I know it's hard. I know it's a struggle. I know, you know, we're older and we don't want to do this again, but you know, we have to do it and we have to always have these conversations with our children, with our grandchildren, with our great grandchildren, you know, as aunties, as uncles, you know, as sisters and brothers, we got to have these conversations with our young people because this puts them in a prevention mindset by us having these conversations, it links us to a prevention mindset in our young people so that when they do get out in the world and they're experiencing things, they're going to remember these topics that we have at the dinner table with them. They're going to remember this. I assure you, they are going to remember this. Now, back in your time, there wasn't no queen of fees having no dinner table conversations. Okay. Okay. So it's different now. We, we are talking more about domestic violence. We're talking more about mental health. We're talking more about mental illness. And I'm going to continue to talk about the hard times because I know that it's something that we struggle with. And we struggle with it in many environments, the workplace, the household, the spiritual communities. We struggle with having these conversations with our young people. You know, I challenged my church home one time. I said, you know what? Let's have an angry meeting. Let's have an angry meeting. Okay. Let's let's hear what everybody is going through. Let's just listen. Let's get a circle of cheers and invite people out to the angry meeting. How about we do that? You know they bypassed me. They didn't want to have that conversation. <laughs> They didn't want to do no angry meeting. We ain't about to do that. Why? These are the conversations that our young people need to have. These are the conversations that our young people need to know. 
Our young people need to be able to chime into their faith-based spaces and say, look, I need y'all to come on, come together, and let's get a support circle going on here for self-harm. We need to be talking about self-harm in March. Because, like, our young people are experiencing this. And they are right at, they are in ministry. They're in college. They're at the house with you. They're high school. They're middle school. They're elementary. And, heck, I wouldn't put it past under two to five. I wouldn't put it past that. I wouldn't put it past it. Because our young people are seeing so much negativity. They're seeing so much negativity out in this world. They seeing it all the time and hearing it all the time and living in it all the time. And they don't have nothing positive. Nobody is saying, let's deal with the anger that our young people are facing here. Let's just have a, 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 a slew of meetings where our young people can set it up and just get angry. And we are here, like my mom and dad said to me, we're going to support you. You will get over this. You will be okay. I'm so glad we had, I'm, I guarantee you, our young people will have a fabulous time releasing in a safe space their frustration and agony. Okay, mom, you said what? Great grandma, you, you are so wonderful and I thank you. No, you're a great grandma. Uh-uh, I'm not no great grandma, mom. You're a great grandma. Hold on now, baby. Watch out, okay? Um, I want to thank everybody for chiming in tonight. We got sort of off to a late start. We started around 8.10 or so. So I'm still on time right now. I wanted to do a complete hour of this conversation for our young people that are out there who are listening in and our mom and dads and all of the dinner tables that are chiming in with me tonight. This is so wonderful. I feel so great. I wanted to cry a couple of times, but I kind of held back my tears to get through this important conversation um, for all of us tonight. Um, I want you to um, really chime in, you know, and you can read on, again, the National Alliance for Mental Illnesses. You can just go there and read up, you know, on things that you want to talk about at your dinner table with our young people. You know, just pick a topic, throw it out there, you know, and say, look, we're going to cook some dinner. And we're going to sit down and the dinner table can go on the road with you. It can go to McDonald's with you, Chick-fil-A with you. It can go in the household with you. You know, it can travel with you because we want to make sure that we're always keeping our young people in a prevention mind state so that when they're faced with traumatic things and tragedies in their life, they're going to remember these conversations. I promise you that. Okay. So if someone wants to chime into me, Serious inquiries only. You can do that. Um, of course, you see my information down here. You can go to um, the Google search and just type in DVWMT um, and everything about Domestic Violence Wiz Mini Tags organization will come up. Um, you can reach out to me at 202-821-8933. Um, serious inquiries only. If you feel like, you know, you need to know more. You un, you know, you heard some things that you want to chime into. Um, or, you know, if some things you have more questions, you're not really sure. Chime in. Nobody has to know that you're chiming in and taking care of your dinner table. You can do this and nobody has to be in your business because people need to start really minding their business. And I do mean literally minding their own business at their own dinner tables and getting our young people into a prevention mind state. That takes a lot of focus, a lot of time, a lot of communication, effective communication, a lot of support. You know, we don't have to send our children out to these vast programs. We don't. We can prepare them right at our dinner tables. And this is what God wants us to do. I believe he shot COVID on us so we can get back at these dinner tables and start dealing with our issues. At our dinner tables. So I want to thank everybody for chiming in. Let me say a short prayer to our, for our young people out there. Young people, go down and pray with me. Lord God, 
I want you to touch every young person, Father, who may be experiencing self-harm, Father God, who feel like they are alone, Lord God, who feel like they don't understand what they're going through, Lord God, who feel lost inside, Lord God, who feel like suicidal or homicidal, Lord God. I want you to wrap your arms around them, Lord. I want you to comfort them. I want you to rock them, Lord God. But I also want you to send somebody who can be an inspiration to them, who will share their story, Lord God, who will say, I heard a conversation with Queen of Thieves. I had dinner table conversation last night. Let's get together, young people, and watch this, Lord God, to begin to break down those barriers of, you know, um, little children ought to be seen and not heard, Lord God. Open up our dinner tables. Open up those doors where we can become comfortable talking about those hard topics, Lord God, and being supportive to one another, Lord God. And reaching out and touching that next person, Lord God. You know, sharing each other's PTSD, Lord God. Even though we don't want nobody in our business. But we are obligated to share it with our young people that are at our dinner tables, Lord God. Touch my mothers and fathers out there, Lord God, who are struggling to have these conversations, Father God. Touch them, Lord. Touch my grandparents out there, my, my great-grandparents out there that are struggling. To have these conversations with their young people, Lord God. Bring them into the light of sharing, Lord God, with our young people. And Lord, I want you to touch this world. Touch America, Lord God. Bless each and every family that are experiencing COVID, Lord God. Bless each and every family that are experiencing death, you know, Lord God. Touch us, you know, comfort us, you know, help us understand, Lord God. Bring us clarity. Lord God, guide us to those therapeutic sessions, Lord God, that we need to be in to begin to help us with our grieving. Lord God, touch each and every one of us under the sound of my voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for chiming in tonight. And I want you to tell somebody, uh-uh-uh, domestic violence wears many tags. Go in peace and love, my brothers and sisters. Go in peace and love. Thank you for chiming in tonight.